Harper Audio presents Ghost Radio by Leopoldo Gout, performed by Pedro Pascal. Copyright 2008 by Leopoldo Gout. Production copyright 2008 by HarperCollins Publishers. darkness it moved, searching for something tactile, sensing the way following its instincts, for instinct was almost all it had left. Somewhere, some time, some when, it had possessed identity. It had the characteristics and physicality that bound it to a world, but those were gone now. Now it was little more than an urge, a bundled collection of needs with the barest hint of form but the void around it possessed even less form. It knew that somewhere within this void lay the thing it sought, and so it kept moving. And as it moved, unfamiliar features inside it sprang to life. In a hidden fold of its being arose a thing called language. With that came knowledge and consciousness. Its journey deepened. It passed through a cloud of something it could now call sadness and wept. It passed through serenity, and its calm returned. Something inside it prickled. What it sought was near, moving toward it, pushing with all its might. The prickling increased, rushing through it like a torrent of needles. It reveled in this sensation, for it signaled that the end of its journey was near. And even as this thought formed, its journey did end. It had reached its destination, As it basked in this victory, a new word appeared, the name for this thing it had sought so desperately, so diligently, and for so long. The word was radio. Chapter One The Magic Band Joaquin turned the dial on his ham radio, letting his fingers rub against the worn edge. He was trolling the six-meter band, the magic band, Not transmitting, just listening, looking for some conversation, a good rag-chew, as the hams called it, that might distract him and help him forget his worries about the coming week. It was called the Magic Band, because of its unique ability, under the right circumstances, to transmit and receive messages over very long distances with short antennas and low power. For this reason, the band attracted a wide range of aficionados, From high school students looking to get the most out of a cheap rig to the kind of techies who casually tossed around phrases like sporadic E propagation and F2 layer refraction. Tonight it didn't feel very magical. Pedestrian was more like it. The conversations were limp and surprisingly sparse. But somewhere around 50.24 megahertz, just past some Morse code warning of thunderstorms off the Catalina coast, he caught a burst of static that intrigued him. Years ago, Gabriel had taught him about the majesty of white noise, the monoliths of structure hidden in the chaos. And this burst was chunky with structure. He cocked his head toward the speaker, taking it in. It came alive in his mind. He imagined hanging over it, watching it roil beneath him like an angry sea. Then the roiling sea solidified, becoming jagged rocks and mountains. And then it was just sound again, but with a purpose, accreting toward a common goal, sound-seeking personification. The room receded as he leaned closer to the speaker. The sound seemed to tease him, its lattices of structure briefly weaving together only to slide apart seconds later, and what the static became in those short moments of cohesion sent shivers down his spine. It was a voice. It was very clearly a voice. He tried to convince himself he was hearing bleed over from another signal, but this wasn't mixed in with the static. It was a voice constructed from the static. He caught several phonemes and the click of a consonant or two, 
but he couldn't stitch them together. He couldn't make out words. He leaned closer, concentrating. Slowly, from the rise and fall and intonation, he, he realized he was hearing the same sentence repeated over and over again, but he still couldn't make out even a single syllable. He bent even closer, his ear inches from the speaker. His brow furrowed and his muscles tensed as he searched for the meaning. It was almost there. He felt it roll gradually toward him, like a slow-moving ball. Almost. There was nothing else in the world, just him and these sounds. Almost. Nothing but this struggle. Almost. The first word was on the brink of unveiling itself when he felt the presence in the room with him. Something brushed his shoulder. He whipped around, ready to strike, only to see the familiar laughing face of his girlfriend, Alondra. <laughs> I love this. The host of the scariest show on Mexican radio is frightened by a tap on the shoulder. Very funny, Joaquin said, still somewhat shaken. You're a bit like a cartoon character when you're frightened. You're in tease mode tonight, I see. A furry animal, I think. Cartoon rabbit, maybe. And it's not over yet. No, a cartoon mouse. Big eyes, little whiskers, twitching. Joaquin forced a chuckle and his senses returned. He shot Alondra a sly grin. Bet you were one of those girls who got a bit weak-kneed over cartoon animals. Maybe, Alondra said, her eyes going wide and looking very much like a cartoon herself. Let's test the theory. He pulled her close and looked deep into her big brown eyes but you don't seem like a furry animal anymore. That's the thing about us furry animals. In the daytime, we're all hijinks and songs, but at night we get serious, and I mean very serious. Now that's a theory I'd like to test, Alondra said, pulling him toward the bedroom. An hour and a half later, Joaquin lay on his side, looking at Alondra's lean, naked body beside him. It glistened with a thin layer of post-coital sweat, she snuggled close to him, looking into his eyes. You worried about the trip? Not really. Your big play for crossover appeal? You know it's not about that. I know. Still in tease mode, I guess. Joaquin smiled and pulled her closer. Thinking about Gabriel? Joaquin nodded. He hadn't realized it until Alondra asked the question, but Gabriel had been in his thoughts a lot recently. Maybe it was the trip back to Texas. Maybe it was just the time of year. Whatever the reason, Gabriel had felt especially close these last few days. Thought so. He had that look. Joaquin decided not to ask her what she meant by that. He wasn't sure he wanted to know. Do you want to talk about it? Joaquin shook his head. Of course he really did want to talk about it. He wanted to talk about Gabriel and the voice on the radio tonight and the countless other things that had been coursing through his mind since he first learned he'd be heading stateside. But he couldn't do it right now. Maybe not ever. You know, I'm always here for you. Anytime you want. I'd rather just try to get some sleep. <laughs> Emphasis on try. Joaquin leaned over to shut off the light, still holding Alondra against his chest. As he lay back down, Alondra let out a contented sigh. Within minutes, her breathing deepened, and he knew she was fast asleep. Sleep didn't come as easily for Joaquin. His thoughts returned to the voice. He tried to convince himself it was some kind of illusion, brought on by anxiety about the week ahead, but he knew that wasn't the case. He knew this was the first sign that his trip would provide him an answer to the mystery that had plagued him for almost eighteen years. As he drifted off to sleep, thoughts of the voice and the trip receded, and he found himself remembering a recent caller to his radio show. Chapter 2 Call 2344, Thursday, 1223 a.m. I had to call you tonight. Well, I had to call someone, someone who might understand my story. Everyone thinks I'm crazy, but I'm not, I swear. Though I think if I don't find someone who believes me, I may truly go mad. It all started when my marriage went on the skids. You know how the closer you get to someone, the farther away they often seem? That's the way it was with my husband. 
He shut a door inside himself and threw away the key. Every conversation became an argument, every question an accusation. Eventually, he even recoiled from my touch. One night, it got really bad. We said the kind of stuff you should never say to another human being. Evil stuff, stuff that hurt right down to the bone. I knew we couldn't go on this way, so I grabbed my children, Mateo and Josefina, and ran from the house. And I mean ran, pulling the children behind me like rag dolls. They screamed, they cried, but I just had to move to feel the rush of wind against my face. Nothing had felt this good in months. After a few blocks, my head cleared and the insanity of my actions kicked in. Where was I going? What would I do? Before I could even begin to answer these questions, I saw a woman waving at us from down the block. It was Lorenza, a friend from my job. She rushed up to us, concerned. I tried to explain what had happened. I don't think I made much sense. But she nodded compassionately, placed an arm around my shoulder, and led me and the children back to her house. She put Josefina and Mateo to bed in her spare room, fixed me a cup of tea, and... I had a good long cry. She understood where I was coming from. She had a lousy marriage, too, and although I'd never met her husband, he sounded an awful lot like mine. The same distance, the same coldness, the same, well, everything. After talking with Lorenza, I realized I couldn't go back. My marriage had been over for years. It had just taken me a long time to realize it. But I still had nowhere to go and no way to get there. Again... Lorenza came to the rescue. She told me that her parents owned a small house on the outskirts of town. They rented it out to earn some extra income, but it wasn't occupied at the time, and Lorenza told me that the children and I could stay there as long as we wanted. It wasn't much of a place, she said, but it would give us a roof over our heads while I planned our next move. She asked if I wanted to go. I nodded. The longer I stayed, the greater the chance my husband might show up looking for me. So we grabbed the children, bundled them into the car, and drove off into the night. We drove for hours. The house was not on the outskirts of town at all, but in a sleepy, desert community some 200 miles away. At that point, I didn't care. The motion of the car relaxed me, and the desert air smelled wonderful. At around 2 a.m., Lorenza turned off the highway and onto a gravel road. We continued on for about a mile and then parked in a clearing. I pulled the kids out of the car and looked around. The moon was almost full, and it illuminated everything around me. I spotted a cactus or two and the vague shape of distant mountains, but no house. I turned back to Lorenza only to find that she and the car had vanished. Even the gravel road we'd been driving down only scant seconds before was nowhere to be seen. Worst of all, my children were gone. I called their names loudly, frantically, into the moonlit night, but the only response was the wind whipping across the desert and the distant, plaintive call of a coyote. Finally, not knowing what else to do, I started walking. I walked and I walked, each step more laborious than the last. As dawn approached, I reached the highway. After several minutes, a car picked me up and drove me to a nearby bus station. Once inside, I found a payphone and called my husband. I was shocked when Lorenza answered the phone. I asked her if Josefina and Mattel were all right. She told me they were, but was curious about why I wanted to know. I told her that I had the right to know the whereabouts of my own children. Your children, Lorenza said. Josefina and Mateo are my children. I can't remember what I said next. I screamed. I wept. I sounded like a madwoman. Finally, Lorenza put a man on the phone. A man she called her husband. I recognized the voice immediately. It was my husband. He spoke to me calmly, sounding as distant as ever. Chapter 3 The Past Encroaches Get into the cab. We're going to miss our flight. Alondra said insistently. Joaquin wanted to comply. The car was only inches away. He could be inside it in seconds, but he couldn't move. It was the car, a 1990 Ford Taurus. Color, metallic green. Fleetingly, he wondered why a taxi service would use such an old car. 
But this thought was quickly pushed aside by a crush of memories about a car just like this and a trip so long ago. He could smell the upholstery, see the back of his father's neck, and feel the ground bumping beneath him. The memory was so vivid it almost hurt. He could even remember how the volume knob felt on his beat-up Sony Walkman. Joaquin, come on. Joaquin took a deep breath and reached for the door handle. Chapter 4 1990 Metallic Green Ford Taurus Joaquin stared out the car window, listening to a mixtape on his rundown Walkman. The sun, suspended in a bright, cloudless sky, swept the highway with a harsh, blinding light. He found it hard to keep from blinking. He maxed the volume. Another sunny day, he thought, squinting at the passing vehicles through the insect graveyard on the windshield. The sun had shone this way before. It would shine this way again. A forgettable day. An anonymous day. But Joaquin welcomed this. He wanted this day, this trip, to be over as soon as possible. He wanted to return to Mexico unaffected, unmarked. So much had gone right in the last few weeks. Things that had never gone right for him before. Things that made a difference. Things that made him happy. He prayed that nothing on this trip would change that. A lot of 15-year-olds say prayers like this. They're rarely answered. This one wouldn't be either. Up to this point, the trip from Mexico City with his parents had been uneventful. Airport to airport with no delay, through customs without a hitch, their luggage among the first off the carousel, and there wasn't even a line at the car rental place. They grabbed a quick bite at a roadside steak joint and then headed for downtown Houston and their hotel. Joaquin hoped it would continue this way. Then his father opened his mouth. What do you say we take a tour through the Skyline District before hitting the hotel, Joaquin? I really want you to see that du buffet. Joaquin cringed. Dad and his art lessons. Why was it that adults always wanted to teach you boring stuff? Dad, I'm actually kind of tired. Joaquin said, hoping that would be enough. It wasn't. This du buffet changed my life. You're gonna look at it. Joaquin sighed, resigned to his fate. At 15, the idea of a family trip felt ludicrous to him. His differences with his parents, more now than ever before, seemed as vast and impassable as the empty, silent reaches of outer space. His father tried to nurture in him a taste for modern art, but Joaquin never paid much attention. He had his own ideas. He flipped the tape and hit play. The mix of punk, metal, classic rock, and electronic music crushed reality, hurtling him into a world of oral bliss. As Tangerine Dream's Phaedra came on, his father stopped the car in front of 1100 Louisiana Street. Joaquin looked up and saw Du Buffet's Monument au Fantôme. Without a word, he got out of the car and walked up to the sculpture. Strange, irregular shapes outlined in thick black lines, suggesting human and animal forms. Christopher Frankie's Moog synthesizer caressed these irregular forms while the amber light of sunset gentled against the rough edges. He was captivated by the sculpture. He moved into the center of the piece and sat cross-legged on the ground. He looked up, watching clouds roll overhead through Du Buffet's embracing forms. As he unhurriedly slouched back to the car, he felt a strange sensation, as if he'd spied the corner of some immense, hidden object. It sent a tiny bat squeak of recognition through his body. Had his father's lessons finally sunk in? If true, he wouldn't let on. Ever. What do you think about Du Buffet? asked his father. Like him. Already knew his work, mumbled Joaquin, and then was silent. Those were the last words Joaquin spoke till they arrived at the hotel. His parents were accustomed to these long silences. Joaquin often milked the silences, hoping they might read his teenage angst to act as something more profound. Not today. He wasn't thinking about them. Something else occupied his thoughts. Her name was Claudia Guerrero. Considered the prettiest girl in school, she had filled his thoughts for months, even before they started dating. 
They had intended to spend the weekend together unsupervised. Every teenage boy's dream, a weekend alone with the hottest girl in school. But this trip had blown that out of the water. He tried to convince his parents to let him stay, but they wouldn't budge. Your grandmother is very sick. Who knows how much more time she has, his mother said. Just the same, he didn't know how long his relationship with Claudia would last, and to lose that precious time was devastating. Doubly so because Claudia's parents had kept her under close watch after finding a pile of Polaroids of a dick, Ernesto Myers, they later learned, in their daughter's mouth. It didn't help when she explained that all of her friends had pictures just like those. Joaquin's argument did gain him something. His mother agreed to buy him an inexpensive electric guitar. The bribe worked. He stopped resisting the trip. Immediately afterward, he regretted it. Why did he give in for so little? He should have insisted on a vintage 62 Stratocaster, or at least a Fender. At the hotel, while his parents were out, Joaquin called Claudia. She picked up on the second ring. He immediately launched into a rant. He told her that he was fed up, that he hated the food and the hotel. There was nothing that disgusted him more than hospitals. He would have to spend the entire next day in one. When he tried to tell her about the Dubuffet sculpture, he couldn't find the right words to describe it and ended up changing the subject. He was too embarrassed to tell her that he loved her or missed her or that he wanted to touch her breasts. So he said goodbye with a cold chow. Chow. Excellent move, he thought. The conversation frustrated him. For a while, he lay in bed and watched TV. He wasn't enjoying it at all. He couldn't believe the caravan of imbeciles that paraded around, submitting to the most ridiculous stunts imaginable. He fell asleep, numbly contemplating the decomposing wasteland of late-night television. The next day, after a bland hotel breakfast, they got into the rented Ford and went to the hospital. Joaquin listened to the dead Kennedys. Efficiency and progress is ours once more, now that we have the neutron bomb. It's nice and quick and clean and gets things done. His parents listened to the radio, some talk program. Under Biafra's growl, he heard a voice say, You really should listen. He rewound the tape and played it again. It wasn't there. Weird, he thought, but must have been my imagination. But somewhere deep in his brain, nestled in the limbic system, a preternatural fear arose. Danger was near. Chapter 5 1990 Black Volvo Model 740 Gabriel stretched out in the back seat, but the minute sneakers met leather. If you lay down back there, take your sneakers off. Gabriel moved his legs slightly so his feet just dangled over the edge. Gabriel, I'm serious. Dad, they're not touching the leather. Gabriel? With a grumpy sigh, Gabriel sat up. Dad and his pristine leather seats. Fuck him. What's with him in this car? Gabriel thought as he stared out the window. It was all so boring. Another day with his parents, another drive in the fantastic Swedish machine. Tedium. This would have been a great day for jamming with his band or just hanging out in his room listening to records and smoking a little weed. But once again, he was forced to endure the unbearable ritual of the drive. It was just a pretext for taking a spin in his dad's brand new Volvo Turbo. Fuck him. And fuck pristine leather. And fuck Swedish engineering, too. Gabriel was so sick of hearing this crap. The only thing that excited Gabriel about his father's new car was the sound of its engine. He liked that. He imagined recording it in all different ways. How would it sound, he wondered, if he poured two pounds of sugar into the gas tank? What if it blew up or was showered with a powerful acid? How would it sound then? Gabriel imagined amplifying and replaying in slow motion the sputter of gasoline as it combusted inside the pistons. Gabriel had no love of cars. Music and sound were his passions. His obsessions, they were what he knew best. A penchant for sonic experimentation awakened in him when he discovered Hans Heuser and Albert Savigno, the Dadaist musicians of the early 20th century industrial bands from the 80s like Throbbing Gristle and Coil, and the synth-pop groups Art of Noise and OMD. 
After diving deep into numerous avant-garde bands and immersing himself in the entire musical spectrum, inch by inch, he formed his own concept of what music should be. One of his first compositions was based on a Diana Ross record played backward. Sound fascinated him, from the crackle of static electricity to the brutal, sordid, macabre, and raw qualities of Einstürz und der Neubauten. He was also fascinated by playful compositions, elegant sound collages and smart paraphrases of the Pixies, Bad Brains, and even the Carpenters. His taste was eclectic. He enjoyed Stravinsky and folkloric Jarocho songs from Veracruz. He liked listening to pop. He loved the most demented virtuoso performances, and he could fall into a virtual trance surrounded by the loud and ferocious sound of prog metal. He didn't have a favorite genre. He believed that styles should merge and fuse in order to produce something more vital. He knew that was what he wanted to do. He had no doubt that he was meant to be a musician. The only reason he hadn't already quit school was that it was the best place to meet girls. Of course, there was the little detail that his parents would never in a million years allow that, even though they generally supported his musical adventures. Their support was no small matter. His acoustic arrangements were loud, incoherent cacophonies of incongruous sounds that would drive anybody crazy and frequently did. They always encouraged his desire to be a musician, as long as he finished high school and got into the conservatory first. Likewise, if he continued with photography, he would have to take it seriously and probably go to art school. This, they said, would allow him time to give it careful consideration, to avoid making a decision he'd regret. Imagine what it would be like if you realized at 40 that you chose the wrong profession. Just think about how hard it would be to change your direction at that stage, his father always said. Gabriel knew he was right. The life of a musician could be difficult. Most ended up doing menial jobs just to put food on the table. On one occasion, he had even answered his father by saying, I don't plan on living that long. Because of this offhand remark, Gabriel's parents sent him to a psychologist, Dr. Kraus. Right out of central casting, he was bald and bearded, with a stern mouth and soft, considerate eyes. By the second session, Gabriel had the doctor snowed. He made Krauss believe that he had religious hallucinations, homosexual desires, parasitical instincts, and later, as he improved his routine, bulimia and attention deficit disorder. Gabriel read psychiatry books to better craft his imaginary conditions. He studied Freud, quoting cases verbatim, leaving Dr. Krauss confused and frustrated. After six months, he resigned from treatment a final admission that Gabriel was immune to his methods and techniques. To the untrained ear, Gabriel's music sounded chaotic, an auditory jumble, yet a patient, educated ear heard form and structure. Gabriel had a natural aptitude for composition. He created strangely elaborate soundscapes, canons, fugues, exceptional paraphrases and interpretations of a variety of musical forms, both classical and popular. Since he didn't have any formal training, he could only write rudimentary music, which often didn't fully express what he intended. But it didn't matter. He felt the music. It was his language. He could say things with tone, note, and meter that he could never have done with words. While Gabriel listened to the engine, his father fiddled with the car's numerous gadgets, turning handles, pushing buttons, changing the radio station. He switched quickly from classical music to an interview with an astronomer discussing radio telescopes and then to Sympathy for the Devil by the Rolling Stones. He looked back at Gabriel. Do you want to hear the real masters? Stop fooling around and focus on the road. I don't like the way that van is driving in front of us, said his mother. She had been very quiet up to now. Mm, not crazy about the stones, said Gabriel. What do you mean? The stones started everything. Yeah, answered Gabriel without any interest. Okay, your loss, said his father, and he changed the station again. Then Gabriel noticed the gray van that had worried his mother. It swerved wildly. A deep voice came over the radio. You really should listen. Chapter 6 12.34 p.m. A van skidded out of control. Wheels lifting off concrete, flipping. Joaquin saw a woman flailing inside the van, 
her eyes wide with horror. He thought he could smell the sparks flying off the vehicle as it scraped across the concrete. Then he heard a squeal and turned to see a Volvo hurtling toward them. Gonna kill, 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 kill the poor tonight, Biafra howled in his ears. His voice made everything seem like it was happening in slow motion. A strange apathy overcame him. He found himself studying the Volvo driver's face as it careened toward him. It was a pleasant face, only slightly marred by the rictus of fear. It looked familiar. Did he know this person, he wondered? No, he told himself, it must be some kind of future memory without really knowing what that meant. In this expanded moment, he thought about a lot of odd things. He realized the accident meant they wouldn't get to the hospital in time to visit his grandmother. This would delay them for hours. Bummer. Then he thought about telling the story to Claudia. She was deadly afraid of car accidents. She would be scared as he described it. Then he could console her. Console her with sex. It would work. He knew it. Oh, right, he thought. I'm about to be in an accident. The notion seemed distant, remote. I could be disfigured. Would Claudia still love me? Would she still want me with a face full of scars? Could she be that superficial? Maybe. Joaquin had no idea how she'd react. What if he injured his hands or his fingers? How long would it be before he could stroke a female body or his guitar? What if he never could? He hoped the accident wouldn't affect his mother's promise to buy him a guitar, even if it was just a cheap one. In Guitar Player magazine, he'd seen an ad for a store in suburban Houston where they sold used fenders at unbelievable prices. He'd written the address down on a piece of paper that he put in his pocket. Maybe he'd at least get a fender. Not the cheap Japanese job he'd almost settled on. He'd forgotten about writing down that address. Why had he forgotten... The moment this thought crossed his mind, a sound like a thousand power cords filled his ears. Bits of twisted metal flew at him from every direction. Oh, right, he remembered. I'm about to be in an accident. What's happened to gravity, he wondered. Everything went black. Chapter 7 12.51 p.m. Gabriel opened his eyes. Through a chrysalis of jagged metal, he saw a woman in the distance, covering her face and repeating, Shit! Shit! My skin's burning! My skin's burning! Come quick! Roger, it burns! He wanted to see what was wrong. He turned, searing pain. Blackness. Fourteen minutes later, Joaquin awoke on a stretcher with an oxygen mask strapped over his face. He could only see rough shapes, and he heard voices, distant, garbled. Front seat, killed instantly, meat wagon. Another voice mixed with his, complaining. Can you imagine? What would you do if your boss said something like that? The first voice again, clearer. You did the right thing, but you got to think about how this is going to affect your retirement. Pass me the scissors. Thanks. There's nothing more we can do here. How long before the meat wagon arrives? He couldn't understand what they were talking about. It was as if they were referring to strangers... For a moment, he thought he was hearing a medical show. He continued to listen. If we can't stop the hemorrhaging, this one's going to code on us, said another voice farther away. I don't like these shows, Gabriel thought. I'm going to change the channel. Where's the remote? Will someone pass the remote? He heard laughing and a joke about couch potatoes that he didn't understand. Then he sank back into the blackness. Wonderful welcoming blackness. Chapter 8 A Voice at 30,000 Feet Blackness The lights flickered several times and then sprang back to life, filling the plane's cabin with a warm glow. Joaquin glanced at Alondra. She was asleep. He brushed a strand of hair from her face and she let out a peaceful sigh. Sleeping, she looked like a different person, a calmer, more centered soul. Joaquin wished he could join her, but he always had difficulty with this, and on planes it was virtually impossible. He picked up his book and tried to read, but his mind wandered, and he found himself becoming intrigued by the sound of the engine. 
What had been a mere background hum revealed deeper and more specific characteristics. He put down the book, cocked his head, and listened. Concentrating, he heard organic rhythms, almost like breathing, hidden within the blare. He looked around the cabin. The other passengers went about their business, unaware, reading, chatting, drinking, and eating, oblivious to the symphony surrounding them. Joaquin looked away, drawn in by the sound. It pulled him away from the mundane concerns of the moment into a universe where layers of meaning rested in bizarre and unknown places, where overlooked details of life become a secret code embodying hitherto unimaginable mysteries. Dragging him deeper into this world was the increasing feeling that there was sentience coiled within the engine noise. He leaned his head against the window, pressing nearer to the vibrations. He hoped this closeness would not only allow him to hear more clearly, but bring him into communion with this awareness, make him part of it. With his ear to the window, he did pick up new layers. The pulsating rhythm under the hum shifted from merely organic to distinctly human. It became the labored breath of a human being, a person gasping for air a person trying to speak. He mashed his ear harder against the window and stilled his own breathing, willing himself to hear, willing the engine to speak. A part of his brain told him this wasn't real, an oral illusion, but he quieted that voice and listened more intently. All the extraneous noise fell away and only the strange labored breathing remained. Joaquin heard the rasping of dry, cracked lips the suggestion of a tongue sliding across the roof of a mouth. He almost saw the mouth, a mouth flecked with blood, the victim of some trauma, an act of violence that made speaking all but impossible. He held his breath and sent out calming, soothing thoughts, hoping to ease the being who owned this injured mouth, ease its mind and help it speak. At first he sent this request out as a feeling, just an amorphous suggestion, but his desire to hear more coalesced into words, not spoken, but as real as if they had been. The sentence in his head began in a vague and rambling form. Come on, please speak. I want to hear your voice. Come on. Come on. Then he pared it down, simplifying it into the essential request. Come on, talk. Then it just became, talk. He repeated the word over and over again in his head. Talk, talk, talk. He waited and listened. He heard the dry lips crack and the breath gasp in an elephantine struggle for speech. Talk, talk, talk. The gasps increased, a desperate attempt to fill lungs which could not possibly exist with air air so this hidden sentience could finally deliver its message to Joaquin, and he desperately wanted to know what that message was. He switched to a coaxing word. Yes. 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 The gasping stopped. Joaquin's skin prickled as he waited for the first word. The seconds ticked by. Tick. 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 The moment expanded. The cloud of now hovered around Joaquin, embracing him with its large, maternal hands. Thoughts of destiny and the buried mists of his painful past rose slowly to the surface as he waited for a word. He closed his eyes, willing himself deeper into the communion, deeper into this new world. Images flashed through his mind, faces contorted in pain, burned flesh, walls splashed with blood. Still, the being did not speak. Joaquin felt his entire body tense, his eyelids jamming together, his hands clenching into fists. The plane shook, knocking his head against the window. The lights flickered. He sat back, rubbing the side of his head. His link with the being, the sentience, was gone. The plane lurched again. Something skittered across the floor, knocking against his foot. He bent down and picked it up. It was an iPod. Through the headphones, he could hear the words of a familiar song. Kill. Kill the poor. Chapter 9 
dead Kennedys in an ambulance. Gabriel felt himself being lifted into an ambulance. Through bleary eyes, he saw another stretcher rolling in alongside him. On it lay another boy about his age. He looked battered and bruised. His eyes flickered open and closed. The boy seemed to be struggling for consciousness. Two paramedics got in and the ambulance took off, sirens wailing. Gabriel stared at the boy. He wondered if he looked as bad. The paramedics were working around him, putting some kind of needle in his arm. But it all seemed far away, as did his pain. He felt like he had a broken leg, but it was information from outside, like a telegram he'd received from a far-off land. The boy next to him began to hum as if his life depended upon it. Maybe it did. Over the blare of the siren, Gabriel recognized the lines from Kill the Poor by the Dead Kennedys. That song had been running through his head lately. An odd coincidence, he thought. He started humming as well. The other boy caught on, and this seemed to energize him. Then they sang together. Jobless millions whisked away. At last we have more room to play. All systems go to kill the poor tonight. Gonna kill, 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 kill the poor tonight. Gabriel knew they weren't quite capturing the spirit or energy of the song, but he found this punk anthem comforting. It was as though the song had been created for this moment, for this purpose. A giddiness swept over him, a joy unlike anything he'd felt in his short life. Sure, it might be the painkillers pumping through his veins, but he didn't care. He embraced it. The paramedics laughed at the strange display, but Gabriel kept singing. Perhaps he subconsciously understood the darkness of this day. Perhaps, somewhere deep in his unconscious, he knew of the pain and grief that lay ahead. But now, it was just about this odd duet. It was about dreaming himself into some dingy punk club, standing on the stage, screaming into the microphone while he looked down at the roiling mosh pit below, giving voice to the pain and cynicism of a generation of lost youth. The crowd shouted and cheered. He was in that club, singing his heart out, until he finally lost consciousness. Chapter 10 St. Michael's Hospital When Joaquin opened his eyes, he was prostrate in a bed. He knew he was in a hospital and realized that intense pain had awakened him. There was someone in his room. She was dressed in white. He asked her about his father. Without even turning to look at him, the nurse answered as she left the room. Dead, just like your mother, both of them dead. He didn't see her face. He tried to yell and call her back, but no sound came out. He couldn't move. He spent the next few hours suffering, immobilized, in profound silence, surrounded by blank white walls, sweating, shivering, every bone in his body hurting. When the doctor on call finally arrived, Joaquin told him what the nurse had said. The surgeon, visibly upset, left the room without another word. Joaquin heard raised voices in the hallway, then deeper, more professional tones. Several moments later, the doctor returned. I want to apologize on behalf of the hospital. This is not how we do things. I'm profoundly sorry, the doctor said. That's okay, Joaquin said, not sure why he was so forgiving. If it's any consolation, they didn't suffer. In these types of collisions, death is usually instantaneous. Joaquin found himself wondering why a painless, instantaneous death should be thought of as comforting. It terrified him. Son, you have some hard times ahead. You're going to have to be very strong. Across the hall, in another white room, Gabriel opened his eyes. Almost before he was fully conscious, he was yelling, yelling for someone to come. No one did. He found the call button and pressed it. Moments later, a nurse entered. My parents are dead, aren't they? I wouldn't know that. I, I wouldn't know. You'll have to talk to the doctor. Are they dead? he asked, raising his voice. The nurse looked at him. The mixture of compassion and pity Gabriel saw in her eyes was all the answer he needed. He sank down into the bed. The notion of tears crossed his mind. None fell. 
Both boys were alone, wounded, and scared. Their futures were suddenly completely unsure. Joaquin's only relative in Houston was his grandmother, who'd undergone surgery a few hours after the accident. No one knew about the deaths until after the operation was over. They were waiting for her to be out of danger before giving her the terrible news. None of Gabriel's relatives had been located yet. Several days passed before Gabriel and Joaquin met. They were both in wheelchairs. The nurses who were pushing them down the hallway gave them a moment alone. Joaquin recognized Gabriel as the person from the ambulance without knowing exactly how, since they'd never actually seen each other, and spoke to him. You crashed into us, right? I what? You were in the Volvo that hit us. You were in the Ford? The nurses told me about you. Do you like the dead Kennedys? Joaquin asked a little anxiously, wanting to change the subject. He wasn't ready to talk about the accident yet. Yep. Kill, kill the poor, Gabriel intoned, his voice off-key. Joaquin was relieved that Gabriel also remembered what had happened in the ambulance. This meant it hadn't all been a hallucination. He raised his hand as best he could to give him a high five. Gabriel stretched out his arm and touched his palm. It would be nice to have some music in here, he said. There's a TV in the room they put me in, but I don't even get a stinking radio. I love music. I need music. You play an instrument? Yeah. How'd you guess? I can just tell. Guitar and synthesizer, but I don't know if I'll ever play again. I can't feel these fingers, he said, lifting his right hand. Maybe we'll be able to jam together sometime. At this point, as Gabriel's nurse returned, both boys noticed her slim, athletic legs, which were barely veiled by a skirt that modestly covered her knees, and each suddenly got a hard on. They realized that they had something else in common, a taste for women whose long legs were encased in uniforms. See you around, he said as he rolled away. I'll be here, Joaquin said, thinking that neither of them had even asked about the other's injuries or mentioned his parents. Joaquin had been dreading an encounter with the van's survivor, and he was surprised by what had just happened. He wasn't able to truly comprehend his parents' death until much later on. The famous stages of pain, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, were all jumbled together in his confused mind. In his darkest hours, he'd hated the driver of the other car and told himself he'd seek revenge against its survivor. He imagined cutting the bastard's head off with a machete and feeding it to the stray dogs of Tijuana. But when he saw the focus of his hatred that first time, his anger melted away. He had no desire for revenge. He just saw another sad, wounded boy, a kindred soul. He looked forward to speaking to him again, and even, perhaps someday, playing music together. Something good had to come out of this horrible catastrophe. He sought the good on those dark and painful days. Days he spent silently crying in his room, avoiding the looks of compassion and pity in his roommate's eyes. And there were the whispers. He lost both of his parents. He'll never walk again. They're sending him to an orphanage. Joaquin pretended not to hear, wishing for his music, something, anything to shut out their voices. But his prized Walkman, which he'd had for years, was lost, pulverized on the highway. So he lay there with only the TV for distraction, stoically bearing the soap operas, talk shows, and entertainment programs his roommates watched. The days passed, and he slowly healed. Chapter 11 Helicopter Wishes I hate hospitals, Joaquin said, tossing his suitcase on the bed. You mean hotels? Why? What did I say? You said hospitals. Jeez, Joaquin said, shaking his head. Alondra walked over to him and rubbed his shoulders and the back of his neck. You've been in a mood since we landed. Is there anything you want to talk about? Joaquin pulled away, unzipped his suitcase, took out a manila folder, and leafed through the papers it contained. He couldn't find the paper he needed and tossed the folder across the room in disgust. He walked over to the window and drew back the curtains. The Dallas skyline spread out before him, glittering the night sky. Whenever he thought of America, this was the image that sprang to mind, gleaming skyscrapers against a night sky. But looking at them now, he felt removed. 
He wasn't sure he wanted to be in America. Wasn't sure he could tolerate the shimmering newness of Dallas. He'd expected this to be a sort of homecoming. The prodigal son returns to show he made good in the great wide world. But he didn't feel like a prodigal son, not in the slightest. He felt like a child, a sad, lonely child crying in the night for his parents. And Alondra wasn't helping. She thought he needed to share his feelings about Gabriel in those painful and glorious days so long ago. But talking wouldn't ease his feelings. It would only make them more intense. And then there was this other thing, the strange being that sought communion with him. He'd sensed it back in Mexico, sensed it at some deep and transcendent level. Back there he thought it held answers, answers to the deepest and greatest questions of his life. Now he wasn't so sure. Perhaps it was a dark force drawing him in, a spider perched on its web waiting. Spider webs are seductive. He couldn't pull himself away, even if it meant ruin, even if it meant death. Some distance away, a helicopter was circling a skyscraper. Its lights flashed as it dipped and turned. A part of Joaquin wished he was inside that helicopter, flying through the Dallas night. As he watched the helicopter, he noticed something strange. The flashing lights didn't strobe. They pulsated, and it was a type of pulsation he was familiar with. It was Morse code. Almost unconsciously, he translated the code, thinking it was probably a humorous whim on the part of the pilot. But halfway into his translation, he realized that wasn't the case. He backed away from the window, goose flesh rising on his arms and legs. Are you okay? He spun around, focusing on Alondra. This is going to be intense. What is? Everything. Alondra demanded that Joaquin explain, but he couldn't even formulate a sentence. Other words filled his head, the words from that helicopter's pulsating light. He moved back toward the window, almost tiptoeing. He looked for the helicopter. It wasn't there. No, wait. There it was, and the light was still pulsating, repeating its ominous message. He watched it carefully, making sure it said what he thought and wasn't a figment of his imagination. He was correct, and it was even more shocking seeing it a second time. Joaquin, we'll be talking soon. The casual, mundane nature of the message made it especially frightening, like a demon wearing a t-shirt. Joaquin stared at the helicopter as the message repeated over and over again. Each time, he shivered. Then the light flashed, break, and Joaquin steeled himself for another shock, but again, he was met with banality. Goodbye and best wishes. It sent this message only once. Then the light returned to its normal strobe, and the helicopter veered away, disappearing into a cloud. Chapter 12 A Dark Happiness It felt Joaquin's fear, and it liked it. It also liked the new words it was learning. Airplane engine, iPod, helicopter, and Morse code. It liked the taste of these words. They possessed a crisp tang, as did the first moment of communion with Joaquin, which it cherished. Although it could not see Joaquin, it felt him. It felt his confusion and his seeking heart. These feelings gave it sustenance and purpose. When it knew Joaquin had received its message, these sensations intensified. In its vast somewhere, it reeled and spun with joy. It knew in another time, another place, it had felt this revelry before. It had marveled at accomplishment. It had spun and leaped in another shape, another form. But it pushed away such concepts and plunged itself into the moment. As it felt Joaquin receiving the words again, it drank in his fear, gobbled up every morsel. And once again it whirled and whirled, marveling in its supreme majesty. Abruptly this jubilation stopped. Joaquin was gone. It was alone. Alone? This too was a new word, but this one tasted sour. After swallowing the word, it felt empty inside emptiness. 
another distasteful word. This further emptied it. It became so hollow it couldn't move, so it drifted down into the dark valleys of its some place. It felt dissipated. It wanted to give up. Then a power coiled deep inside sprang open, filling it with energy. It couldn't immediately identify this new energy, but it welcomed and embraced it. As it careened around its world, it remembered Joaquin's fear and the lovely taste. It wanted more. It needed more. Now it knew that no matter what happened, no matter what, it would find that fear and devour it. Chapter 13 Minibar, Maxi Problem Alondra shot out of the elevator and headed down the corridor in search of Watt's room. After several wrong turns, she found it and knocked on the door. Watt answered, wearing a hotel bathrobe and holding a cocktail in one hand and an open jar of macadamia nuts in the other. Hey, Alondra, he said, ushering her into the room. Just hitting the minibar a bit. A bit, she said with a chuckle. There was a range of electronic gadgets strewn about the room. A Nagra tape recorder sat on the bed. A cornucopia of microphones erupted from a black plastic case. Some battery packs and chargers sat on the dresser. And on the floor lay a battered laptop connected to a variety of devices via a spider web of USB cables. Other than a black iPod, Alondra couldn't identify most of it. Could I get you something to drink? What are you having? Red Bull and vodka? Ew, Alondra said with a shiver of disgust. You should try one. It's really good. No, I think I'll pass. But the vodka sounds good. I'll have that. Kettle one if they have it. Watt opened the minibar and scanned the shelves. Hmm, kettle one, kettle one. Ah, there it is, he said, snatching a bottle. Want anything with it? Ice and, uh, tonic water? Watt grabbed a few cubes from the ice bucket, cracked open the bottles, poured with a bartender's flourish, and handed Alondra the finished product. She accepted the drink, sat down on the edge of the bed, and took a sip. The cold vodka tasted crisp and clean, and she had an intense flash of a sauna she'd visited in Finland. So, how's the man? Watt asked cheerfully. That's kind of why I came down here. Really? Something wrong? I'm worried about him. What's the matter? He's got the jitters or something? No. I mean, worried. Mm, not sure I get you. Alondra sipped her way back to Finland and took a long, deep breath. Well, she said, searching for the right words. It's like, um, God, it's like, um, shit, I don't, come on, just spit it out. Jeez, I thought I was supposed to be the one with communication issues, he said, popping a nut into his mouth. Okay, I'll just say it. Seconds passed. Alondra remained silent. She looked into Watt's expectant eyes. She'd always liked his eyes. Wide, blue, intense, and dotted with flecks of green. But as much as she liked them, she expected them to narrow in disbelief at what she had to say. She just had to get it out. And so, after another quick trip to Finland, she did. I'm worried about his sanity, she said. As she'd predicted, Watt's eyes narrowed, and he turned away. Well, don't be ridiculous. I'm serious. Well, of course he's crazy. I mean, we're all crazy. But he's not crazy crazy. I'm not so sure. Watt paced as he went on a long, rambling rant about everything he knew and felt about Joaquin. About insanity and how it works. About why Joaquin didn't fit the criteria, either constitutionally or pathologically. And on and on. Alondra tried to listen. But the words became a background hum. She was too worried to accept what sounded like rationalization. Finally, Watt stopped talking. Alondra looked up. Watt must have sensed her desperation because he grabbed her by the shoulders and, staring into her eyes, said, He's fine. He really is. This is an intense time for him. Cut him a little slack. Alondra looked away. Okay, okay, Watt said. I'll tell you what. 
Tomorrow morning, I'll have breakfast along with him. I'll pay attention. I'll listen to him. I'll keep an open mind. Alondra looked down at the bedspread. Its blue and green lattice pattern perfectly reflected the mix of complexity and order she currently sought in her life. Maybe Watt was right. Maybe there was nothing wrong. Maybe she was projecting her own fears and concerns about the show and their life together onto Joaquin. She really wasn't sure. Alondra, did you hear me? You can't have breakfast with him tomorrow. He's doing an interview with Newsweek magazine, she said, her eyes still fixed on the blue and green bedspread. Chapter 14 The Interview Before entering the cafe, I called Alondra. She answered with a long, languid hello. She knew it was me again, trying to convince her to come to the interview. Alondra, what is it now? I just wanted to be clear. I'd be happier if you were at the interview with me. And I told you I would if you have lunch with me and talk about what's going on. There's nothing going on with me. I'm just worried about the show. Even you don't believe that. Will you be there? Alondra hung up. She was probably right. I should talk to her about what has been going on, but I know it scares her when I talk about these things. She always says, This is just crap from your show. Don't bring it home with you. She was right. Partly. Hell, one of the reasons I created Ghost Radio was to convince myself that the strange experiences I'd had were nonsense. Of course, another part of me had launched the show to justify them. And now I was minutes away from glossing over these salient facts, promoting the show as an entertaining bundle of things that go bump in the night. I knew that was another reason Alondra wasn't eager to join me for this interview. She hated this crap. She wasn't interested in having to answer fatuous questions like, isn't it difficult to work with your significant other? I couldn't imagine her revealing such intimacies to a stranger. She was already ambivalent about participating in Ghost Radio. It had taken a lot of coaxing for her to accept the role of co-host. She claimed it could affect her credibility as a researcher and professor, but I knew it wasn't that. I humored her, arguing that the program would be a hands-on laboratory for her work on urban folklore, yet I was certain that the reason she finally accepted had nothing to do with research. It was something deeper. She feared I'd lose myself in the show, and she wanted to be there to pull me back. She claimed to be a committed skeptic, but I often felt that deep down she believed, and it scared her. It made her mock everything paranormal or supernatural. She was a master of circular logic. How else could she hold down a serious academic job while continuing to edit provocative underground zines? She used that slippery quality on the show. She had a knack for evading intense or uncomfortable situations for speaking cogently but vaguely. She always bowed out gracefully without having to run or hide, but never drew attention to herself. I'm sure many saw this behavior as cool or aloof. I had another word for it. That word was fear. Whatever her stated reasons, I was sure that this was the fundamental reason she hadn't joined me for the interview. She was afraid. I entered the cafe lost in these thoughts. The reporter from Newsweek was there waiting for me. He was easy to spot. His recorder sat on the table, and he was simultaneously talking on his cell phone, taking notes, reading emails on his laptop, and frenetically typing a text message into his Blackberry. A pile of magazines and newspapers filled the only empty seat. Joaquin, I said, offering my hand. The reporter shook it tensely and made a mute grimace that might have meant pleased to meet you, followed by a quick give-me-a-minute hand raise. One by one, he terminated his communications. It was like watching an assembly line robot. Then he cleared the chair and finally looked me in the eye. Sorry about all that. I'm supposed to do this interview with Nicole Kidman, and her people just got cute. I saw through his attempt to develop a bond with me by letting me in on this little confidence. Again, I didn't see this interview with Newsweek as a personal triumph. I had no love of publicity. On the contrary, I didn't trust it at all. But I wanted people to listen to my show, and this would help make that happen. 
As a consumer of popular culture, I appreciated that Newsweek's interest meant that ghost radio had made the jump. It had slipped out of the fringe and into the mainstream. The reporter introduced himself as Eric Prue, then immediately launched into comparisons between my program and the TV series Ugly Betty, a Colombian soap opera that had streaked its way like lightning into an American primetime slot. I replied that comparing a soap opera to a program like mine purely on the basis of their Hispanic origin seemed simplistic to me. I stopped myself from adding that it seemed idiotic and borderline racist. Should I have stopped? Maybe that tack would have worked. Instead, I accepted the general amazement that these programs had garnered acceptance from a public that is not used to consuming foreign culture. I almost used the word alien, but caught myself at the last second. I spoke about how the program had started in Mexico, spawned with the no expectations. It happened pretty much before I realized what was going on. The music program I was hosting started to revolve more and more around the death-themed readings and comments I made between songs, but things really took off when I started taking calls on the air. So many wanted to talk about the supernatural, and I let them. The program evolved. It grew and expanded, becoming something new and different. This wasn't entirely true, but it was the story I always told. I told Prue that my main influence, although I wasn't really aware of it at the time, was another radio show that I discovered and listened to compulsively while I was hospitalized in Houston after the accident that killed my parents. I loved its horror stories, which still fascinate me and on occasion still terrify me, but I loved its format even more. It was thanks in large part to that program that I was able to begin to recover from the tragedy I had endured. When was this? 1990? Prue nodded and made a note in his pad. I could read his scrawl even upside down. It said, Research, Supernatural Radio Show, Houston, 1990. But you said that your show's format happened almost accidentally. This story makes it seem more like a plan. You might think that, as the host, I guided the program. In fact, it was the program that guided me. Within a year, we had an extremely loyal fan base. Some obsessive. Troublingly so.